So what I want to tell you, Mike, to, to start with, actually, is that, uh, be, because I just realized this a few minutes ago, is that quite recently, still, I thought very little of the mandolin. <laughs> It's probably because, also, for example, I thought very little of the harpsichord. Mm -hmm. I thought it's just kind of all this plucked stuff and the, guitar, the, the classical guitar, when I heard classical guitar play all these classical pieces and Baroque and, and classical era pieces, I thought that just, that just well, it just completely didn't do it for me. It feel natural, yeah. <laughs> like the ba the ba is in three. And then came uh, working together with Jan Muinarski, which mm -hmm. we started working together four years ago. And he uses a, a banjola, mm -hmm. uh, so banjo, mand banjo, banjo yeah. mandolin, uh, playing uh, folklore Warsaw music. Mm -hmm. And then I started kind of looking at it slightly differently. And then at some point, we were working together so much uh, and you know, sending each other films and music and inspiring each other that I caught it somehow. And then, I, and, and then it, it flipped from being my least favorite instrument to my most favorite instrument <laughs> after, right up to the piano. That's how, how strange one is. Uh, wow. And, and, that's, and, and so that's how, that's how the mandolin affair started. And then we met. Well. Uh, because this was also a result of that, you know. I was invited to, by the, mm, uh, uh, by the uh, Warsaw Summer Jazz Days, to invite some. They invited me to invite someone from abroad to play mm -hmm. a duet with me. I thought, well, this guy, Mike Marshall, the mandolin, I can finally see how it's done up close. <laughs>
tell me how it all started with, oh. the, with the Gare Orchestra. The Gare Mandolin Orchestra, well, it started when I was approached by the Jewish Festival in Berkeley, California, because they had been approached by a man named Avner Yonai. And it turns out that Avner's uncle and grandfather were in the Gare Mandolin Orchestra. And um, they, his grandfather left and went to Israel before things heated up in Poland and um, everyone else in the orchestra passed away. He didn't know that, he was doing research on his family and he found this picture of, his, of this orchestra. And then that spurred on this idea for him. And he approached the Berkeley Jewish Festival and said, I want to recreate this mandolin orchestra. Who should we get to uh, organize the group? And they said, oh, Mike Marshall, he's, he's your guy. He, he knows all the mandolin players. We have to, we have to be And so it was an 11-piece ensemble, and I, I had this amazing opportunity to call whoever I wanted to organize a great ensemble of players. He also hired like a private detective to go around Poland and try to find music in antique shops and music stores that a group like this would have been playing at that time. So he, he, he gave us some charts, some amazing uh, music. Actually, some of it was printed on very small paper, but it unfolded like six pages that you'd put on a stand. I remember this Polish suite with all the dances, the mazurka, the polonaise, the quariak, or how do you? Krakowiak. Krakowiak. Yeah, so all orchestrated for mandolins, mandolas, mandocellos, mando bass. And so we did it at the Berkeley Festival, and it was a huge success and he documented the whole experience and um, put together a really nice documentary of just that one concert and us rehearsing and interviews with people after the concert. And somehow it's, it got sent to Warsaw, to the Jewish festival, the, the Singer Festival, mm -hmm. and they invited us over. <laughs>
So it was an, an amazing experience. Not only did we play the festival, but we played in the synagogue where this group was, in Gorka in Valley. Gorka Valley yeah. And that was one of the heaviest experiences of my life, you know, to be in that building and to know that we were playing this music. Um, actually, a woman came from Israel, and she was 10 or 11 when she left um, Gorka Valley. All of her family perished, but she made it out. And she remembers, oh, her father was the cantor of that synagogue. And she remembers some of the melodies that they were sing that he was singing when he was there. And she wrote some of them down. So right before we're going on stage, she came to me with this piece of music and said, could you play this? And I was like, so I asked her if she could sing it, just so I could get a sense of the melody, and she started singing this beautiful piece. I was like falling apart and said, well, I'll do it if you'll come and sing it with me. So in the middle of the show, I invited her up, and we just, I just went down into the audience, and we did it acoustically for these thousand people in this synagogue. It was very, very powerful, very intense.
I saw the Gare Orchestra documentary, and and that filled a, and and that filled another gap, uh, and and we started, and so then I saw, you know, I was exposed to mandolin orchestras, both in the historical sense and these modern, amazing uh, players, and then we constructed out of all of this these influences. We built together with Yannick and some friends a amateur mandolin orchestra, and we started writing for this band and started. F feeling this and loving it and experiencing it. Uh, and it was wonderful because we were all musicians and we we're all professional musicians yeah. and yet we didn't really know how to, so we were both, we both knew what we're doing and we both also completely didn't know how to do it. So it was a great, uh, it was a great experience, great, great, great emotion there. And then, uh, and then, and then uh, Kajtek Prochyra from the Pauline uh, museum and Kaitek asked me, well, would you like to, you know, continue this? We've worked together several times with the Pauline Museum. Mm -hmm. So when he learned that I have this man passion for mandolin and this, and it all then came together and said, well, well listen, you want to write a, you want to write a new piece because the the, the Gerd Orchestra already did what it, it did, the reconstruction, and now it'd be nice if it had a, if it could con continue having a life of its own uh, and, and being relevant uh, to modern times. So I, you know, this invitation was beautiful and I was super happy to do it.
Great to be able to create a monument like this, which is a living monument. You know, it's not like you just make a plaque and say, here live these people and we want to honor them. But to bring it back to life was uh, very strong. And now to the idea that it could continue, and that you would write a piece for it, uh, something contemporary to push it forward into the future. It's really exciting, especially given the fact that you've fallen in love with the mandolin now. <laughs> you, you finally come on over. And that's, that's not uncommon, though, for people who grew up playing classical music, either violin or piano or jazz, to think of the mandolin as this younger second cousin. That, but I think it's coming into its own now with this younger generation of players who are finding ways of using it in classical music and in jazz, and realizing that it has such a rich history all over the world. <laughs> Thank you. 
Orchestras are popular, especially in Germany, which was a big surprise to me. As you know, my wife is German, Katharina Lichtenberg, and she is a professor of mandolin at the Cologne Music Conservatory. And I think she said there's 250 mandolin orchestras just mm -hmm. in Germany. <laughs> now, in America, it was really popular during this golden age from the 1900 until about 1925. That was the real glory period. But some of those orchestras are still going today. All the, all the big cities have one. New York, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, LA, Berkeley. So there's probably a good dozen or so still in the country.
Thank you for being interested and, and putting in the time. The music you've written is incredible. It was a pleasure and a challenge to play. Pleasure is mine as well. 